Good evening, everyone. And welcome once again to our Bhagavad Gita satsang. I'm Hari Kirtan Das. It's a pleasure to be here with you and an honor to have you here with me. And I trust you will indulge me as I uh, ask you, as is our usual habit, to please raise your hand in order to let me know that I can be heard. And yes, there we go. Hands are all up. Therefore, I guess you can all hear me for better or for worse. Uh, I have a slightly new system this evening as we do our housekeeping. Let's just go through that quickly. So as always, you can adjust your audio settings and your viewing options in the interface that should have controls for you up in the upper right hand corner. You need not worry about your microphone or your video camera because I cannot see or hear you, but you can apparently see and hear me. You can type a question into the Q&A if you would like to be heard. You can also type a comment into the chat window. I have a second monitor that allows me to be paperless for one thing, but it also means that it's a little bit easier for me to spread the windows out and keep track of things. So at some point this evening, I am sure to ask you to enter something into the chat that is not exactly a question or a comment, but of course, questions and comments can go into the Q&A box as is usual. Our last class, uh, chapter 11, the Yoga of Divine Revelation continued with verses five through 12. We spoke about how one can see whatever one wishes to see in the universal form. That is to say, when we come to the material world, whatever it is we're looking for, uh, we will find it, but not in the form that will bring us the ultimate fulfillment we seek from whatever it is we are searching after or chasing after. We spoke about the limits of material vision and how the revelation of divinity in a form that can be seen, the theophany uh, of God, uh, is try, like trying to look at the light of a thousand suns. So we, as a point of comparison to give some idea about something that is really beyond any uh, limits of language. This evening, we will speak a little bit about what it's like, or what it might be like, to see everything everywhere, all in one place, all at the same time. And how, if at all, we can speak about this kind of experience. We'll also speak about astonishment as a rasa, or a mood of relationship, a flavor, a taste. Uh, I will elaborate a little bit more on the meaning of rasa as our evening progresses. And in this section, Arjuna will begin to offer prayers. We will see that there is a change in the relationship uh, from Arjuna's position. And he will begin to express his thoughts and feelings about this change in their relationship. So this will cover verses 13 through 19 of chapter 11. And we will, we will begin, as we always do, with our invocation mantra. So for those of you who are new to Sanskrit diacritical marks on transliterated Sanskrit, Sanskrit written in the Roman alphabet, the dot over the M indicates that we close the back of our tongue to the back of the roof of our mouths. At the same time, we bring our lips together in front. Uh, a bar across a vowel, in this case an A means an open and elongated version of that sound as opposed to a closed or more closed truncated version of that sound, as I hope will become self-evident 
as I chant, and then you chant back. Here we go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Translation, I offer my respects to the Supreme Person, the Son of Vasudev, who is the all-pervading transcendence. So last week and the week before, we entered into the 11th chapter, the Yoga of Theophany, or the Yoga of Divine Revelation, the revelation of God to a human being in a visible form. In this case, a mind-blowing visible form, which is to say the form of the entire universe or how the Supreme Person enters into and in a sense becomes the entire material world. We started last week's program with verse number five, which goes like this. The blessed Lord said, Krishna speaking, O son of Prita, another name for Arjuna, behold my hundreds and thousands of divine forms appearing in a wonderful multitude of categories, colors, and shapes. So this verse indicates that Krishna is everything. However, that doesn't mean that everything is Krishna. It sounds a little bit like a Zen koan. It is certainly a paradox. Krishna is the one, or the Supreme Person is the one who has hundreds and thousands of divine forms, but not every one of those forms in and of itself has hundreds and thousands of divine forms. So in this way, uh, Hmm. So here's a question for all of you. Nia, thank you very much. Uh, please enter into the chat what you see right now. Are you seeing just me on video or are you also seeing my slide that says last week, et cetera, et cetera? Tell me what you got. And I will look for your comments in the You're seeing slides, you, me, and my list of slides? Just me. Hmm. Well, this is an interesting, you and your laptop view, including opening pick. All right, well, this is uh, an interesting technical development. I did record a test webinar just to see what came across, and I got uh, a recording that just had the slide with me in the little window and such like that. Um, and it looks to me like all of you are seeing something different, which is quite curious. Well, I'm going to do my best Tonight, uh, for the most part, you're simply going to, uh, looks like my desktop screen, which is particularly interesting because I cannot see my desktop screen. What I see is uh, slides. Let's try, all right, I'm gonna try this. Whoops. Let's go to here and here. And this may solve some of the mystery of what's going on here. All right, so now I'm betting that you can see my desktop 
meaning that you are looking at my PowerPoint slideshow with me up in the corner. Please let me know if that is correct. Kevin, thank you very much. All right, so what you're seeing is not my slideshow, but rather my PowerPoint application and with all the little slides on the side. And okay, yes, very good. All right, well, that answers a very important question for me. And I hope that solves the problem for all of you in terms of what it is that you are seeing. Uh, and now we're all on the same page, looks like to me. So yay, another crisis fades into the oblivion. I'll drink to that. All right, Nia, thanks again for bringing that uh, technical issue to my attention. Let's continue. So, Krishna is able to open the doors to this realm of reality whereby Arjuna can see how Krishna is the universe and everything in it. But that's Krishna's unique position. Not everything within Krishna is the complete whole. They're parts of the complete whole. But certainly the complete whole is all the parts. So this particular verse and this idea of hundreds and thousands of divine forms and such is often, uh, in my view, misinterpreted as indicating that everything is God, which is not saying the same thing as God is everything. So I just wanted to make that point from what we covered last week before we move on to this week. This week, our translations will be from verses 13 through 19. So now I trust uh, that you can all see me full screen. Please let me know. Okie dokie. So beginning with, thank you. Ah, yay, very good. All right, now we know it's working. So beginning with uh, verse number 13, now, this is Sanjaya, the secretary of Dhritarashtra, the blind king, whose sons uh, are on the battlefield with the sons of his late brother, Pandu. So Sanjaya is narrating what, he's narrating the entire Bhagavad Gita, and at this point he is telling Dhritarashtra what Arjuna is seeing. And by Krishna's grace, Sanjaya knows what Arjuna is seeing because he can see it too. However, all the combatants assembled on either side of the battlefield cannot see it. They just see two guys sitting on a chariot talking. Uh, so Sanjaya is given some special dispensation. And as we will see in a few verses, the demigods, are also privy to this vision. So they'll show up in a little bit. So here we go. These are the uh, verses. Then we'll go back verse by verse and look at each one in detail. So Sanjaya continues. Then and there, the son of Pandu, Arjuna, beheld the complete expanse of the universe, situated in one place, yet infinitely divided, within the body of the God of gods. Then, this is verse 14, then, overwhelmed with amazement, with the hairs on his body standing on end, Arjuna, the conqueror of wealth, bowed his head to the divine Lord and, with palms prayerfully joined, began to speak. Verse 15, Arjuna said, O my Lord, I see all the demigods, along with all manner of 
other beings assembled in your body. I see Lord Brahma sitting on the lotus flower, Lord Shiva, and all the great sages and divine serpents. Verse 16. O Lord of the universe, in the form of the universe, I see innumerable arms, bellies, mouths, and eyes expanding without limit in every direction. I see no end, no middle, nor any beginning to your unlimited form. Verse 17. I see you everywhere adorned with various crowns, clubs, and discs, a limitless form of shining splendor glowing on all sides like blazing fire, like the immeasurable radiance of the sun, so difficult to behold all at once. Verse 18. You are the imperishable, the ultimate object of knowledge and the supreme resting place of all. You are inexhaustible, the eternal maintainer of eternal religious principles. In my opinion, you are the supreme person. Verse 19. You have no beginning, no middle, nor any end. Your power is limitless. Your arms are limitless. And the sun and moon are your eyes. I see you with blazing fire pouring forth from your mouth, burning this entire universe with the heat of your radiance. Exciting stuff. All right. So now let's go back and take a closer look at each of these verses. And if you have any questions about just the verses that I've read, uh, or if they inspire any particular comments, please go ahead, pop them in the Q&A box. So verse 13, once again. Then and there, the son of Pandu, Arjuna, beheld the complete expanse of the universe, situated in one place, yet infinitely divided, within the body of the god of gods. So this sounds like uh, quite an experience to see something like this, to see everything in the universe all in one place and yet infinitely divided. So what Arjuna is seeing is the simultaneous absolute unity and infinite diversity of the material world, of the universe. Everything is connected in one sense, uh, there is a certain oneness of everything. And yet there is at the same time an everythingness of everything. How do you wrap your head around that? Especially when you see it in its entirety, all in one place, all at the same time. This is not within the realm of the mind. It's beyond psychological experience. It's beyond rational experience. The mind and its interpretive faculty is our normal interface through which we decipher reality. And as such, what happens for all of us is that we each live in our own reality tunnel, which is constructed out of a combination of our mind, our intelligence, and our ego. And that defines both the scope of our perception of reality and the boundary that others can't cross. Um, our reality tunnel may intersect or overlap with the reality, reality tunnels of Others, members of our family, members of our tribe, friends, society, whatever. There are intersections. We, you know, we don't, our, our reality tunnel doesn't exist in isolation. It intersects with others. But ultimately, uh, it's our own. It's uniquely our own uh, because it's the province of the one mind 
that we have come to identify as our own mind. And unless someone is clairvoyant, uh, one cannot read another's thoughts. My thoughts, my experience of being is uniquely mine, except that I share it with Krishna because my senses are Krishna's senses because I'm a part of Krishna. I'm not Krishna because I can't experience anyone else's senses and anyone else's mind other than my own. But Krishna is the uh, ultimate uh, system administrator. So he has complete access to the full scope of reality, including my experience of reality. So normally when uh, someone reads another person's mind, it's considered exceptionally intrusive. And for some of us, that might be an issue in terms of our relationship with the Supreme Person. He's always here. And there's really no getting around the fact that he's omniscient and therefore our thoughts are also his thoughts. So that's our normal way of being. That's our default operating system is we interpret our experience through the mind and that's our reality tunnel. And what's happened is Krishna has lifted Arjuna out of his reality tunnel and is sharing a portion of his own reality tunnel. And that is pretty mind blowing. So by Krishna's grace and not by Arjuna's endeavor, Arjuna is now seeing through what you could call the mystical eye of revelation, which gives him access to an experience that's beyond the scope of mental interpretation. Uh, it's, it's as if the entirety of reality has opened up in the space between, behind or beyond Arjuna's thoughts. And it's not that one will necessarily see the same vision in that space should one arrive there. But it is the space in which we have the opportunity to experience the spiritual that lies beyond the rational, beyond the psychological. So in this case, uh, this is not merely a psychological phenomenon. It's a divinely gifted phenomenon. And it's blowing Arjuna's mind. And it will be progressively more blown as we go through each of these verses. So our next verse is verse 14. Sanjaya continues, then Overwhelmed with amazement, with the hairs of his body standing on end, Arjuna, the conqueror of wealth, bowed his head to the divine Lord and with palms prayerfully joined, began to speak. Okay. You are seeing the sum total of reality, past, present, and future, all in one place, all at the same time. And this is what Arjuna sees, and now he is about to speak. What would you say in this situation? What would you say to the person who is capable of showing you this vision of themselves. Pop something into the chat window if you feel inspired and if something comes to mind as to what you might say. I might be at a loss for words.
it is, uh, yeah, that's a good one. How can I serve you? Uh, mm -hmm. We can tell something about what Arjuna is going to say. He's telegraphing the mood of what he's about to say by his body language. The word used to indicate Arjuna, the word that Sanjaya uses to uh, indicate Arjuna in this verse, translates as the conqueror of wealth. And it's a little ironic because the attribute of wealth is bestowed by the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi Devi, who is truly only conquered by Vishnu or Krishna. So it's kind of an indication that in spite of the fact that Arjuna has uh, an exalted position within his own sphere, he is taking a very humble position by bowing his head, by folding his hands in prayer. He's preparing uh, to offer prayers to his friend, Krishna, who has now revealed himself as I shouldn't say as, he has revealed how he is God in the world. Arjuna already accepted that Krishna was the supreme being, but upon seeing how he is the supreme being, this has made the whole experience a little more concrete. So, we also have to take into consideration that Krishna is Arjuna's best friend. They're buddies, they're pals. So what if your best friend showed you this universal form? If it turned out that your, your buddy who you hang out with is actually the supreme person, and you kind of knew that, but you didn't really ever see it, and now he shows it to you or she shows it to you. So uh, how would that change your feeling about your best friend, how would that change your orientation to the relationship? If you have any thoughts on that, please share them with me in the chat as well. Krishna is known by many, many names, and one of them is Akila Rasa Amrita Murti. So Akila Rasa Amrita Murti, uh, otherwise known as the perfect embodiment of all Rasas, or another way to put it is Krishna is the reservoir of all relationships. All possible relationships reside within Krishna. The, the, the full potential of all possible relationships are there within him. So I'm going to break this phrase up into pieces. Akila means all-inclusive, everything. So all. Rasa is a difficult word to translate into English. It's a word that has uh, multiple different facets and no one English word can really come up to the standard of, of all that different nuance. Uh, Words that are used to speak about rasa are juice, taste, and flavor, uh, or mellow, uh, indicating a, a kind of, it's, it's a poetic indication that it's a taste that also quenches one's thirst. Um, so the idea is that someone who has developed a thirst for spiritual experience can develop their relationship with the Supreme Person by drinking from the unlimited reservoir of possible relationships. Um, ah, thank you, Jill, adding a few uh, ideas about Rasa. 
And Nia, I'll come back to your com content, comment in just a moment. Amrita means nectar or like nectar, nectarian. So something very sweet, something that tastes super, super wonderful. So whereas rasa is a juicy taste, amrita indicates the sweetness or the um, fruitiness of that taste. And then murti means form. So akila, rasa, amrita, murti, means the nectarian form of all relational flavors. So you can think of it like that. Um, and we hear that Arjuna took up this position, this prayerful pose with his hairs on his body standing on end. Now, sometimes we associate that with fear. And in this case, hair standing on end is understood to be a symptom of spiritual ecstasy. It's not a fear. His natural loving relationship, friendship, uh, was overwhelmed by wonder, amazement. And that's why he reacted in this way. Now, Arjuna's default rasa, or flavor of relationship with Krishna, is one of fraternal affection. They're friends, they're buddies, they're pals, they're cousins, they hang out, they relax together, do fun stuff together. And in the science of bhakti yoga, fraternal affection is a symptom of continuous spiritual ecstasy which is to say it's a, a symptom of ecstatic love of God that's possible only when one is fully situated in the transcendental platform. In other words, you don't fall away. It's not like sometimes you're aware of God and sometimes you're not, but rather you're always aware of God, but you're not aware of the fact that the person you're with is God because that aspect of their personality has disappeared in a sense behind the predominant feeling of friendship. In order to be relaxed with God, you have to kind of forget that he's God. And therefore, in order to have a genuine friendship, genuine relationship of, of friendship, uh, the God part, the Aishvarya, is a Sanskrit word we used in the last couple of weeks. The opulence, the majesty of God, kind of has to take a back seat. Well, now uh, what's happened is the Aishvarya, the majesty, the power, um, that has now eclipsed the friendship. So Arjuna is astonished at what he's seeing, and astonishment at the majesty of God is actually a step down in the hierarchy of transcendence because now it creates some distance. It's, it's an indirect expression of ecstatic love as opposed to a direct expression. Friendship is a direct expression. Astonishment is an indirect expression. So direct perception of Krishna's personal qualities inspire personal devotional ecstasies in personal relationships. So for example, Krishna in his human-like form is very, very beautiful. His uh, features are very, very pleasing. His speech is very pleasing and clever. Uh, he's eternally youthful. He's always truthful and not so surprisingly, he's a genius. Uh, so he's uh, got unlimited intelligence. And it's, that's all very inspiring. A direct perception of Krishna's power, on the other hand, inspires devotional ecstasy in a subordinate relationship. So hence, how can I serve you? Um, 
So astonishment, awe, reverence. And when you see that much power, it's just kind of natural that you'll also experience some, some fear. Now the hair standing on end in this case is not fear, but as we see when we move towards the end of these verses for tonight, uh, Arjuna's mood is going to start to develop a little bit of trepidation as he's totally blown away by what he's seeing. The other way to think about hair standing on end is that it's an indication that the life force of a person is moving out into the outer edge of the body and coming into the contact with the element of air. And so that hairs on the body standing on end are an indication of that. Okay, let me get to uh, comment. So Nia's comment, I would continue with the battle as Krishna suggests, perhaps Arjuna saw his destiny. He hasn't seen it yet, but he's about to. We're going to cover the verses where Krishna shows Arjuna the outcome of the battle of Kurukshetra in next week's set of verses. We're going to approach them this evening and then next week we will look at those specific verses. So yes, Arjuna is going to see his destiny and that's what's going to stimulate or, or instigate uh, the transition from astonishment to fear. So yeah, you've uh, foreshadowed this uh, section very nicely. And yeah, Krishna is uh, gonna give away the ending. So, um, there you have it. Okay, thank you for your comments. Now let's take a look at verse uh, 15. Uh, one, just one more quick note. Arjuna will see his destiny and have uh, and be inspired to feel fear. However, that fear will also be transcended and uh, Krishna will give him the means by which to transcend that fear. So that is also coming up in uh, later in this chapter. All right, verse 15, Arjuna said, so now we begin Arjuna's prayers. O oh my Lord, I see all the demigods, along with all manner of other beings, assembled in your body. I see Lord Brahma sitting on the lotus flower, Lord Shiva, and all the great sages and divine serpents. So, all the demigods and all manner of other beings assembled means that there are distinct societies of beings in an assembly, like one group of this kind of being, one group of that kind of being, multitudes of assemblies of beings. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you once again. out of order. There we go. Um, so this is very nice because now you can see me putting everything back in order. Okay, the artist at work in real time. So this is a trend, uh, traditional rendering of the universal form. Uh, we have seen uh, more modern interpretation as the title slide for this series uh, or the preliminary, the pre-title slide for this series. And we looked at it last week. So here um, we see an illustration of what Arjuna is seeing. 
are describing to us. So we see the central form of uh, Krishna, but not in his bluish form, at least here. But if we look a little more closely, then we can see that Brahma is situated on the lotus flower right in the midsection of the central portion of the universal form. We heard earlier about all the different arms with the upraised weapons. Uh, all the demigods we see along the sides represented here. So we have Lord Shiva to the right and Lord Vishnu to the left and then Brahma in the middle. So this takes care of our uh, tree murti. So remember the word murti means form. Tree, T-R-I means three, not so surprisingly. So tree murti means the three forms of divinity that control the three qualities of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. So Vishnu is in charge of maintenance, uh, the mode of goodness. Brahma is in charge of creation, the mode of passion, and Shiva is in charge of destruction, the mode of ignorance. And alongside of them, we see uh, indications of various demigods and sages, and then the flaming mouths of the kshatriyas, the kings, the soldiers here. Uh, the different demigods living in the arms of the Supreme Person. So each demigod associated with a uh, different function in the material world um, and uh, different articles uh, to perform those functions, etc. So it's, I hope, interesting to note that Vishnu is emanating from Krishna as opposed to Krishna emanating from Vishnu. Sometimes it's understood that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. However, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam or the Bhagavad Purana, the explanation is that Krishna is actually the original source of all incarnations, expansions, etc. And then when Krishna shows up through the avatar system that he himself has devised, uh, he is personally showing up in his form as the ultimate, original, supreme person. So uh, this illustration gives you an idea of what Arjuna is seeing. And for uh, those of us of a certain age, uh, this illustration of the universal form will forever be associated with this illustration of the universal form. Um, and yeah, uh, Hendrix is great, but he's not that great. I digress. Questions or comments? Tess, I knew you would especially appreciate that. Anyway, let's move on to text number 16. O Lord of the universe in the form of the universe, I see innumerable arms, bellies, mouths, and eyes expanding without limit in every direction. I see no end, no middle, nor any beginning to your unlimited form. So this is a pretty mind-blowing idea because to say form means to indicate a boundary, contours, a form uh, by definition, has a uh, shape. And there's an inside to the shape and the outside to the shape. And it's limited by, by definition. And yet here, Arjuna is quite specifically saying, you have an unlimited form. So it, it's a paradox. It sounds like a contradiction. A form shouldn't be unlimited. And yet, here we have one. A form containing unlimited forms, which is itself unlimited. Well, you know, that's something only God can do. 
is have an unlimited form. And this tells us that the form of the Supreme Being, being unlimited, without beginning, middle, and end, is transcendental to the limitations of this material world and is therefore situated in spiritual reality. In other words, not just a human invention that we come up with because we can't wrap our heads around a formless, nameless, energy-less, cognitive nullity that is also the only ultimate absolute reality. So this is an important point that I would like you to consider. The transcendental nature of the form of the absolute divinity, without which absolute divinity would be incomplete if absolute divinity was only formless in absolute reality, then what would be missing is the transcendental form, therefore incomplete. So both have to be there. The uh, transcendental formless reality, in, uh, which we refer to in Sanskrit as Brahman, and the form of absolute transcendental reality in the bodily features of Krishna. Verse 17. Uh, thank you. Verse 17. I see you everywhere adorned with various crowns, clubs, and discs, a limitless form of shining splendor, glowing on all sides like blazing fire, like the immeasurable radiance of the sun, so difficult to behold all at once. So if you're going to see the universal form, bring your sunglasses, because just like looking at the sun is really hard and in most cases not advisable, uh, it's really, really hard for Arjuna to, first of all, focus on everything. And it's all glowing so brightly that you can see it and yet not see it at the same time. So this is another paradox of this particular vision, that Arjuna is seeing this form, and yet it's glowing so brightly that he can hardly see it. Which brings us to text 18. You are imperishable, the ultimate object of knowledge and the supreme resting place of all. You are inexhaustible, the eternal maintainer of eternal religious principles. In my opinion, you are the supreme person. So here Arjuna is both, he's expressing his understanding of what it is he's seeing. This now comes back into the realm of the interpretive mind. The experience is mind blowing, it's beyond anyone's mind. And at the same time, there is still an understanding of the significance of what Arjuna is seeing. And Arjuna now is, is um, articulating what he sees as the significance of what he's seeing. So the first two words in this verse in Sanskrit, tvam aksharam, tvam means you, Aksharam means infallible, but it also has another meaning. Uh, aksharam is also the Sanskrit word for the syllable om. So another way for Arjuna to, to understand what Arjuna is saying 
is he's confirming what Krishna said about himself earlier in the Bhagavad Gita, which is that of sacred syllables, he is the sacred syllable Om. So you are imperishable or you are the sound Om, which indicates to us that the sound Om is imperishable. It's an eternal sound going on always. When we chant Om, we are participating in the emanation of a sound vibration that is already in progress and has always been in progress and will ever be in progress. So when we chant Om, we are connecting to that which is imperishable. Which brings us to text 19, and we are going to chant this verse. There we go. Now, this verse is a little different from the verses we have chanted previously. What makes it different is the number of syllables. This will be an 11 syllable meter. Usually when we chant verses from the Bhagavad Gita, there are eight syllables. And there's a meter that goes with an eight syllable verse. And that's what we normally do. There are a few places in the Gita where the syllables per line expand out to 11. And that means chanting in a different meter. So this would be a nice change of pace. A quick explanation of the diacritical marks. The bar over the vowel once again means a long version of the vowel. Uh, the dot over an M, we have already explained, close your back of your tongue to the back of the roof of your mouth while you close your lips. The dash or the accent mark over an S is a deep SH sound, which means it's deep in the back of your mouth, like pink noise, as opposed to a regular SH sound, white noise. Um, and I think that's it for the transliterated Sanskrit. And at the end to this evening, I'm going to tell you a little something special about Sanskrit. Here we go. I'll chant each line. You chant each line back. Anadi matyantama nantaviryam. Ananta bahum shashi surya netram. Pashyami twam deep Svateja savishvamidham tapantam. That was so much fun, I'm going to do it one more time. Let's do it twice. Here we go. Anadi matyantam anantaviryam. Ananta bahum shashi surya netram. Pashyami tham dipta hutta shavaktram. Svateja savishvamidham tapantam. Translation, you have no beginning, no middle, nor any end. Your power is limitless. Your arms are limitless. And the sun and moon are your eyes. I see you with blazing fire pouring forth from your mouth, the burning, the burning this entire universe with the heat of your radiance.
So this may sound like we have entered into the Department of Redundancy Department insofar as Arjuna has repeated himself here with the idea of no middle, no beginning, no end. But according to uh, spiritual literature, repetition in the course of glorification of the Supreme Being is not considered to be uh, a weakness uh, or a stumbling of the mind, but rather it said that uh, at a time of bewilderment, of wonder, of uh, intense spiritual ecstasy, statements are repeated over and over. Uh, and that's uh, no more a flaw than the uh, repetition of a chorus in a song. Say so that's that's a way to understand this. All right, we're heading into the home stretch. Uh, any last questions or comments about what we have discussed thus far? And while I await your questions and comments, I will forge ahead with a recap of tonight's class. Uh, which was not seeing whatever we wish to see. Yet again, I have failed to tell you what we have just done. Another, yet another violation of Murrow's law. Okay, so what we really did was what I said we were going to do next week, last week, which is we talked about seeing everything everywhere all in one place all at the same time and how totally mind-blowing that is. We spoke about Astonishment as a rasa, we discussed the idea of tastes, flavors of relationships, uh, and how Arjuna's relationship of friendship with Krishna is actually a higher spiritual relationship than the relationship he steps down into now, which is one of awe and reverence, and therefore distance rather than proximity. And that's a kind of interesting way to think about our relationship with divinity and what is actually constitutes higher and lower, the idea that there are hierarchy, hierarchies of relationship in transcendence. That very idea itself is a kind of interesting concept that the Bhagavad Gita offers us. And finally, we began to uh, enter into Arjuna's prayers. Uh, what we will do next week, we will cover verses 20 through 25. This is where Krishna starts to freak everyone out. Everyone meaning Arjuna, the demigods, who are all we find out are also watching, and Sanjaya. Uh, we'll talk a little bit further about how Arjuna takes yet another step down into fear of God, and how fear of God is a lesser modality of worship than awe and reverence to say nothing of feelings of fraternal affection. And as uh, Nia has predicted, death arrives. Uh, Arjuna will see the future. And in this case, it's not going to be pretty. So that's what's happening next time. Okay, question from Kevin. Can you speak a little about the concept at the end of the verse, a burning of this entire universe by your own radiance? Is it an actual burning? Uh, yeah, it is, actually. Um, what, this is a transitional verse. So what's going to happen here, and thank you for specifying which edition of the Gita you're looking at, uh, What's happening here is the vision is changing. It's going from, let's call it a good trip, which is a benign mind blowing experience into kind of a bad trip where we are going to start to see the dark side of God. And God is the destroyer. So in one sense, it's figurative. And in another sense, it's literal. The whole place in due course of time goes up in flames. And 
that's the transition we are making from uh, the brilliant and beautiful mind blowing experience to uh, the element that basically stirs the drink of the material world that keeps the qualities of material nature moving. And that is time. Spoiler. Oh, well. Anyway, thank you for your question. Any, uh, if there's anything else, then uh, please be sure to reach me at Hari at harikirtan.com. Uh, and here's the thing. I mentioned earlier uh, something about Sanskrit. So just before I go, I'm going to be doing a free 60-minute live Sanskrit webinar in a few weeks. I'm putting that together right now. And if you would be interested in joining me for that webinar, either live if you can make it, or of course there will be a, a replay, uh, please let me know. Shoot me an email, hari at harikiratan.com, and let me know if you would like to make sure I let you know about my free online webinar called Sanskrit Made Simple. So that'll be just about pronouncing Sanskrit and getting a sense of understanding Sanskrit, uh, understanding and speaking about yoga through the language of yoga, namely Sanskrit. So that's coming up soon. Uh, okay, we are done with questions. And, and I promised last week that uh, I would smile more. And so I'm going to get all my smiling in right now because I was so lost in thought. I didn't think about it and I, I, I probably didn't do it. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, ending meeting for all. It's a pleasure as always. For me to be here with you, an honor to have you spending this time with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening or rest of your day or rest of your week or rest of your life, whichever the case may be. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.